Hello guys, midway through February we start on the second half of the problems to section 4. As preparation for this I repeated uh, part of problem 3 that took like 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes and then I started on a problem for part B and as you can see having uh, worked for 40 minutes I needed a break so twice I made it wrong then I took the break and then I could finish it and I also found the factor N2S that I was missing when I did it on screen that was my preparation for this problem now first this well-known I think you all know the proof, so uh, you take the derivative, uh, no, you take the Fourier transform of the derivative, write up the formula, and uh, do partial integration, and the limits tend to naught, as they are rapidly decreasing functions, or the f is a rapidly decreasing function, and and so is f mark, by the way. That's the definition of s. And, uh, uh, well, that's it. So let's go to b. I prepared uh, by writing the result of uh, problem 3a. Let's call this guy G of X. Then the Fourier transform. Oops, uh, uh, we just have to be a little, uh, little careful as always. So let's take the uh, Fourier transform of the derivative of this guy first. That's 2x plus a. Oh, that's wrong. And that means uh, we just have to divide by two. Right, so let's go to C. We define theta sub A and super A this way. All right. Now this guy is actually the um, the sum over G of n. So
So by Poisson's uh, equation, it should be equal to the sum of the Fourier transform of n from minus infinity to infinity. And why that should be n minus pi. Um, divided by t there we go and we must compare this the n we've got there this guy agrees and this Oops. Oh yeah, it should just be a uh, y, that's n squared, so that was a mistake. So n squared divided by g. So the n, this factor, and this factor, except that it's 1 divided by t. And that means that this equals pi i divided by square root t, theta super a of 1 divided by t. Was that what we had to prove? No way. So that is a factor pi and something more missing, a factor t. All right. I'll just stop the video while I go through. Uh, let's try to go through it while recording. It, it's weird about that fact, factor 1 pi. It comes up here, and where could it possibly be eaten? And of course, every time I've thought that been a mistake in these uh, problems, I've found that I was the one who made it. Yeah. I take a break. You know, I don't find the mistake. So what I'll do is to test the relation numerically because these two guys actually converge pretty rapidly. And so it's first lunch and then I'll test my relation numerically. Have my lunch and 
relax. Then I looked at the problem again and couldn't find my mistake. So it was the hard way first to ascertain that it was me who made the mistake. And I want to define theta sub. And uh, I just do it by hand to have, have a value to check. And first I try from minus 10 to 10. I believe that would be more than enough. And actually going up to n equals 3 is sufficient. So here we go from minus 5 to 5. And then the uh, other guy. Um, and I knew, of course, that it would be imaginary because the um, uh, this added up with n of opposite sign gives uh, 2i times sine. So we can actually reduce it. And I test that it gives the right result. It does. And now we can finally combine. So I write up the sequence of theta sub a with a being 0 0.3 and t being 0 0.5, 1 and 1.5 and that's the result. And then I try with my formula. It tells you something about me that I try my own formula and not the one in the book. Well, that's up to you to conclude. And then it turns out, of course, that the uh, equation in the book is the correct one and mine is false. Finally, I found the mistake. When we differentiate this guy, we get, of course, 2x plus a but we get as well ah, let's do it in red so blue is better minus pi t what means that finally we have to divide this divide, divide this by minus pi t That was the first one, and for the second formula, as it tends to naught, and that's say the A of t that it goes faster than exponential of the inverse t reciprocal of t well we must use this formula so it's 1 divided by t square root t sum of uh, theta a Now, how do we do this? Uh, 
the powers of course expand very rapidly in n I would like to do it technically correct this time because we have uh, t here to some power and n here You know what? We take one of them out. We write this. No, we have to have n up here. We do it like this. So the first object is to show that uh, this is bounded. Shouldn't this be T? Yes, it should be T. As T tends to naught. Independent of t as a function of n, when n uh, it starts low and then it rises to some maximum and then it f drops off almost exponentially. So it's actually easy to see that it's uniform, uniformly bounded on the whole positive real axis. Uh, we have to do a little better than that because uh, when n is 1 We just put a half pi on it here. Divided by 2t. Then this is bounded. And then in here we used we used n. Oops, uh, it shouldn't be n; it should just be one. No, we need n. We need n. So what we've left.
oops, and halves. And when we could just choose t so small that e to minus pi is less than a half. Didn't we use that to, to get the m? Oh, and that we took off, off out as well, so we have taken two out, a half n and a half n, which just took out a half. So it's minus n. And minus unity. One minus a half to uh, well, it's actually two the next time, but we can just disregard this and take n. So it's two to the second, etc. So it's smaller than or equal to two m minus half pi t, and then this factor can be eaten by choosing this constant slightly smaller. So that should solve part two. And then phi super of t And the sign here, uh, two i, the sign that is just bounded by a factor two. Well, it's the same. So it's tomorrow for the part for the rest of the problem. Good morning guys, February the 5th, no the 15th. I'll prepare a little part question D. Good morning guys, February the 5th, no the 15th. I'll prepare a little part question D. And uh, we shall be using the, the theta and L functions. So I've written up their definitions here. And of course, the integral that we are going to use time and again, just so that I can check it when doubt starts arising. And then we shall uh, express the Mellon transform. So I started doing that. I've from the start exchange sum and integral of course and this is theta sub a and um, it must be expressed in terms of uh, zeta a point s not 2s so I believe that we have to use t to f halves And we can go right at it. So 
So it's pi to minus s halves n plus a minus s. Oops. And then gamma s halves. I see no way of escaping this. Of course, we could use s half minus 1. Should we do that? Well, that wouldn't be a problem, really. We'd just use s half minus 1. Or is plus 1, let's see. Um, It's C to minus S, so it should be plus 1. I think that would be all right. So let's try that and see what happens. Then we get minus 1 here. This, of course, is it should be a function of s, of course, I should write that. This is an, it's an entire function of s. And then we still have to, uh, then it's uh, minus 1 times gamma of s halves plus 1. And Going from naught, that gives us exactly zeta. And then the rest of the sum, that's from n equals minus 1 to minus infinity. So that's n minus a to minus s. So we substitute n with like m plus 1, so it's m plus 1, so it's m plus 1 minus a. Uh, that was the first one. And then we shall do the same with theta super a. All right. And I couldn't prepare that because I didn't know how far down I would come. So I'll just do the same stuff. That's a summation. N. Is that really the definition of L I have there? It seems more like the theta function. Yeah, that 
was the wrong guy. Summation from 1 to infinity, n to minus s times this. Just check it again. n to minus s, right. So we need n to minus s, and that means I will t to s halves minus 1. Oh, it's minus, it's going to be minus s half plus 1. There we go. dt per t. So let's try that. This is a constant. And then the usual integral giving pi to minus 1 plus s halves n to minus, oops, it should be 1 half here. My god. And when we multiply by 2, it gives minus 1. That's an S. And then gamma of S plus 1 halves. I'll just correct it up here. Oop, and this must be the, the this guy must be corrected as well. We sum, and when we sum from naught, no, from one to infinity, we get L of a. <coughs> that's not nice. L of a point s, and then we have a sum from naught to infinity. Uh, that must be subtracted, of course. That must be subtracted. Or, mu or must it? We just have n to minus s. What do we do with it when n is negative? Oh, it's up here at n squared. So that means that it's the uh, it's the absolute value that we raise into s halves. So we don't need to take that in. I've had this thought before, but I forget it from from one time to the next.
But then, on the other hand, when it's an n here, when that becomes negative, we have to subtract it anyway. But then when n is naught, it vanishes. Oh my god! One really needs to be careful here. So it's only from 1, and then it must be subtracted when the signs are done correctly. And now, then, uh, when we change sign on M, N, we must change sign up here as well. There we go. Uh, and that's minus A, so it becomes minus L of 1 minus A point S. Now we need to check up here what's going wrong here, up here as well. Because when n is negative, then this is, and we change sign, then this is a minus, that's a minus n. So it's minus n plus 1, so it needs to be subtracted up here. So we should prove that these two guys, uh, this guy and this guy, these guys are ent entire functions, and I'll just isolate them and, and do it properly. One divided by gamma is an entire function, and it has zeros when this is naught and negative integers. So that means when s is minus two, minus four, etc. And now we isolate L. This is an S, you know that. This is an entire function as well, and it has zeros when s equals minus 1, minus 3, minus 5, minus 1, minus 3, minus 5. So the negative odd numbers. I don't know how it combines with the zeros we found of the uh, two functions added in uh, the previous exercise. I'll have to look at that up. So that was question D.
Now combining that with, uh, I think it was problem four, or was it problem three? That's problem three. Combining that with problem three, we get that the zeta functions and the L functions themselves are entire functions. And maybe we can say something about their zeros. I don't know, maybe we can't. That stops what I'm going to do now. Good morning, February the 16th, Thursday morning. Uh, last night, I felt there was something wrong when I reach uh, the end here. The symmetry didn't quite occur right to me. So I went through it again this morning and this seems right. It's the same being used down here. One plus S halves. And then here, it doesn't say one plus S halves. So that's not good. So we have to correct that. Here it does, here it doesn't. And here pi changed. Here it's correct and then here it's wrong. There we go. And when we come to the next page, it continues. Here we have it again. one of the pasted ones, probably that one. Oh, and the same here. Was it a plus or a minus? I, that was minus, of course. Oh no, here we multiplied it, so it does become 1 plus s halves. Right. So this seems right. And then down here, it's wrong again. Was that pasted as well? And the same here. Yeah, and then we must substitute. Oh, here it's wrong again.
So that was pasted. Not that. That was it. And here we must substitute s with 1 minus s no that is what it is oh I need to do this correctly and uh, I did it on paper so I just pause the video and find out how I'm doing. Yes, I just didn't know what I was doing. So this is the transformation formula and here we must substitute in an A S with S minus 1. And that means it's S minus 1 here. So this is okay and then it's 2 minus S so it's 1 minus S halves 1 minus S halves Oops, it's already up here. And here it's the same. much reduction as possible so I just delete this last this last formula there we go so this is the guy we are going to use So that finishes, finishes part D. Then when we come to E, I better make a new one. We should probably use the same formulas as we proved in problem 3D. So I'll make a pause while writing them. There we are. We start up with this summing h from uh, like naught to capital N and then we must apply that we have an odd character so we just sum from uh, the lower half for instance And then the upper half equals minus h. I'll just do it down here. It's periodic with period n. and chi of minus 1 was minus 1 so that's the change of sign right 
right and this function we can substitute with the uh, with the result from here the this difference I'll just put it up on the next side now it happened again that Voco screen failed but I found out how to do it which means that I can avoid it in the future uh, while it's on pause when I change uh, the page I see or the window I see then it breaks down so now I know that but that means that uh, you didn't see this page being uh, written really so I took the uh, two formulas from problem 3e and then we have uh, collect the two uh, h and uh, n minus h because chi of n minus h equals uh, its uh, periodic and then we use its anti-symmetric or its odd and then it's a minus here so that means that oh this exactly uh, yeah this is the formula and then we apply the transformation formula and get this and then we use the fact that this sum gives g of chi I think this is wrong it's d of chi l of chi bar and uh, n to minus s minus i and then I forgot this too which we need as well So that should be the uh, transformation formula and when we solve the next problem of uh, setting s equal to one half yeah I mean yeah then the left hand side no that's the right uh, the left hand side is gamma pi L of chi point one half equals minus I one divided by square root n g of chi L of chi one half gamma of uh, three quarters pi to minus three quarters and they are these two factors are equal and these are equal uh, and if they are distinct from naught which is probable <laughs> then we get g of chi equals i square root n and that was exactly what we had to prove right then we must show that l of s vanishes if s is a negative odd integer I think I shall combine what I must combine what I've already showed about uh, about this 
this function and I don't have it on the screen and but I believe that I showed that this was this gave zero for s being negative odd integers I'll just check it and then continue I just discovered a mistake here which I corrected and then I found out that the uh, zeros of the zeta function I already had here on this page um, that's where gamma becomes infinity and that's when 1 plus s halves equals naught or a negative integer and that happens for minus 1, minus 3 and not what I wrote here so these are all wrong so it's minus 1, minus 3, minus 5 all the negative odd integers and, and this is the same I did already have that it's logical they should have the same of course so now let's check that was part G check so we come to part uh, we must set s equal to 2k that's a little odd, but we'll do it. Up in this equation. Or, or must we? Uh, it's... Yeah, it's L of uh, 2K. So we set S to 2K and then it becomes, uh, yeah. that plus oh yeah it is and then L of chi or was it chi bar or was it in oh let's write chi bar right so this gives the odd integers when k equals 1, 2, 3, etc. The negative odd integers. And that's where it's naught. And this has a pole. So we uh, multiply this guy with one with uh, yeah with what where are the s's oh I should write 2k here as well This feels a little odd doing it this way. Well, never mind. Let's uh... now 
this should be 2k and then we multiply this with 1 minus k and divide this shouldn't it be 2k no here we get the negative integers and this is a zero Well, we have to divide, divide by 1 minus k. That's very weird because um, when it's a 0 at 1 minus 2k, we ought to divide by 1 minus 2k. These gamma functions are not taken at the same place. This is strange. Another thing is I have to find the, the uh, residues of the gamma function. So I'll just prepare this problem a little better. The ideas should be the same as in problem three. Work on the left hand side and then it was for um, when this is a negative integer. So let's uh, so that's when s is an odd negative integer. And then let's forget the pi for the time being. So we write it as s minus one plus two k. And then when we take the limit for s approaching, it becomes the residue of gamma at minus 1 plus 2k times the derivative at minus 1. No, it's 1 minus 2k, both sides, both places. So it must be subtracted both places. The one minus two K, one minus two K. There we go. 
And the residue here we already know uh, that was now what was that? They do become smaller all the way through. So I think it's one. divided by uh, one minus two uh, k minus one factorial uh, was that what we were about to find I'll just write it a better way. L of L mark of one minus two k exactly. So that was part of the left hand side. So let's take the uh, power of pi into account. And k uh, s tends to one minus two k, so it's one minus two k. It's minus two minus two k. Equals minus n s two minus 1 plus 2k I'll just write it down and then 1 that's 1 half plus k minus a half that's a half this half that's uh, plus k right and then this is the opposite and then finally the L function chi bar at and that's 2k. Finally, we must uh, set k equal to naught, it appears. Oh, that's the, the next. Yeah, set k equal to naught. And that's, oops. No, this doesn't make sense. We could say k equal to unity yeah the 
it's of minus 1, of course, that's the 0. So we said k equal to unity. So this gives 1 and pi to minus 2, that's pi squared. I'll just write it here so I don't forget it. Minus i n gamma of 3 halves That's like gamma of one half times one half. Now that can't be, it should be larger. So, um, well, let's just uh, write it as it is. K tends to one, so it's gamma of three halves pi minus three halves L chi of uh, two square root pi and n of course we need to compute gamma of three halves you know what I'll just make let Mabel do that wonder what to do. I'll take a break while it does that and then not change. Well, I was right. It's 
square root pi halves. I just didn't remember the value at one half. Now, uh, where were we? Gamma of three halves, that was square root pi halves. That's my formula. I'm not, it's, it's not easy to test it numerically, though. Well, that finishes problem five. Well, I just realized that I still hadn't finished. A little detail was missing. And, of course, uh, this imaginary unit I forgot, so it's just right I there. We need to, oh, uh, I don't know where that is. We need to express this in terms of the die logarithm, and we, can, we know how to express this in terms of the die logarithm. Oh, you can't see it. So we already know how to express this in terms of the die logarithm. It was in problem 2b. So that should be copy it. There we go. So this equals minus i uh, yeah the n cancels then i half square root pi g of chi sum chi bar of a l2 of psi to minus a where psi equals e to 2pi divided by capital N. And then they wanted us to, uh, to reduce So this case, where obviously n equals 3, and then we should compute g of chi. Uh, we have done that before, I'll just do it again. Um, so it's omega minus omega bar and that gives it should be i square root 3, yes, the imaginary unit times square root 3. So we multiply by that. And then when L is A, it's L2 of omega 
to minus first. Minus L2 of omega. I don't know, can that be reduced? Of course it's uh, the... Uh, it's twice the imaginary part of L2 of Omega. So let's do that as well. when I do it like that. Yeah. So we only have one in this case. It's lovely. Now I'm confident that I have finished problem five.